Many thanks for your company. This is the AM News. There is a strong push for President Tukufado to declare a state of emergency on endangered water bodies and rivers under siege from illegal mining companies. The Ghana Water Company had earlier issued a warning of stopping production due to significant disruption by illegal mining activities and attacks on its staff by perpetrators. The situation is already dire, with water generation already dropped from 70% to 40% nationwide. Now, residents in these communities are in a state of despair following the damage done to their livelihoods. Say a Juman, Ghana say four Juman. What you see are as a result of the Galamsi activities that are done upstream. All the silts are washed down here. They have destroyed our livelihoods. This has left us struggling in this town. Our fishing business has gone down. All we can boast of now is empty nets. Apologies for that cut, but moving on, the Land to Natural Resources Minister Samuel Abujinapo has served notice of a major crackdown on Galamse hotspots following disruption in supply in the Ashanti and central regions. We are going to have the review today, and I'm, I'm, I'm a thousand percent certain, and I can give you the firm assurance that we're going to deploy, we're going to ramp up our enforcement measures. So all these places you are talking about, we're going to have a, a clean-up there. We're going to have a complete soup. We're going to send uh, law enforcement agencies to take a soup of, of that whole stretch. And, and not just there, so many other places, particularly the central region. We're going to do that. You can be rest assured of that, and you can monitor that. As I say, Operation Halt has never been a continuous operation. It's always been a surgical one. And whenever we find that there's, there's a particular place where... Uh, there's a rise in illegal mining or there's um, uh, a rise in activities and PDT and the rest. We move them in. We're going to do the, conduct the review today and uh, within the next 24 hours, we're going to find the resources and move them. The Deputy Director of, um, at CSIR, Savannah Agricultural Research Institute, Dr. Issa Sugri, has asserted that farmers in the northern region do not have the capacity to go into dry season farming due to the unavailability of irrigation dams. He said the region has only one major irrigation dam, which is the Bogatanga Irrigation, and that single dam cannot do any meaningful crop production to ensure food security in the country. The objective of the capacity building is to equip the farmers in the region with the requisite knowledge on maize, rice, soya beans, and vegetable production via innovative platforms. Speaking in an interview during the training, the deputy director at the CSIR Savannah Agricultural Research Institute, Dr. Issa Sugri, said most farmers farm as early as June reason they are severely impacted by the dry spell. Farmers actually got best seeds all, all right, but most of them went into produce as early as, early as June. And for most crops such as maize, you are better off in northern Ghana. If you are a commercial farmer, producing from 20th June thereabout, do we have access to irrigation facilities such that just after the rainy season is over, from December, northern region, we could go straight into dry season production. But unfortunately, we do not have capacity to go into dry season production. We only have one major irrigation dam in northern Ghana, which is the Buntanga Irrigation. And it cannot do serious crop production for food security for the region. But if policy was working right, we need to have irrigation zones around Yengi zone, around Gushegu, around Tolum, around Bimbila, around Zerzugu zones. There should be major irrigation areas around these, so that if we have emergencies like this, government could quickly deploy 
irrigation, money for irrigation. The managing director of Asafin Business Ventures, Dr. Austin Dobie, who is one of the farmers, said bringing them together on one platform is a great initiative which should be encouraged. Uh, we work in silos, you know, so if we are brought together, that is, I know uh, where I can get my seed, I know where I can get my fertilizer, nice inputs, I know when I harvest, who is taking it, we are working together, the banks are on board, to be, going to be very, very useful, and then we communicate, we plan together, and then implement together, I think it will be very, very useful. That you want to ask. Oh, what I want to say is that yes, uh, platforms working together as uh, partners has not been very easy in the past. So, what is necessary is especially funding. How do we find sustainability? Here, yeah, I'm talking about sustainability. How do we sustain such a platform? You get the ideas all right, but then how do you implement? How do you sustain it? It's going to be uh, a challenge. Ministers of Education and researchers in the education sector calling for a shift in the education delivery on the African continent. The High Stakeholder Conference in Cape Coast on inclusive and equitable quality lifelong learning opportunities has emphasized the immense potential and opportunities that lie ahead, stating that education is the most powerful tool to transform the people of Africa. Speaking at the conference, Deputy Minister of Education, John Intimfojo, emphasized the commitment of government to ensure a critical mass of people is produced. There's more in this report. Speaking at the Sustainable Education and Development Research Conference, John Intimfojo underscored the need for a more educated Africa. He outlined the power of a more educated population in Ghana and on the African continent. We can only leverage on the human capital to get out, us out of our challenges and out of poverty. And that is why we all, as a continent, must be worried. When we hear that Africa, as by 2030, will be the continent whose young people will form 42% of the global youthful population. We must be concerned that what preparation and what, 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 what education are we putting in place to ensure that they become 42% of the critical mass of the youth on the, on, in the whole world globally who would contribute to 42% of innovations, 42% of the jobs that ought to be created, and 42% of the inventions that we must see. We all must be concerned. And so, as education ministers, as researchers, as education stakeholders, and people who influence policies and investments across the continent, we must equally be concerned about the fact that out of the 244 million young people between the ages of 6 and 18 that are out of school globally, about 40 percent, equating to about 98 million of them, are from Africa. Vice Chancellor of the University of Johannesburg in South Africa, Professor Lothurka George Impedi called for a consistency in the education delivery in Africa. When we talk about a changing world, understanding that through the lens of the fourth industrial revolution, there are systemic shifts, we are called to respond accordingly in order to remain relevant. Ladies and gentlemen, it doesn't have to stand on top of the mountain and say, look at us, we are the best. The question is, what are you doing for the hungry? What are you doing uh, about unemployment? What are you doing about poverty? And that calls for a different type of a university, especially for Africa. Certainly, the issue is that universities tend to stand, look, we are the oldest, we are the youngest, we are the sexiest, and so on. And you look at what are these universities doing? For ordinary people, nothing. And that is what needs to change. And this is how we need to um, measure universities in terms of what do we do for the marginalized amongst us, the forgotten people. Vice Chancellor of the Cape Coast Technical University, Professor Kweku Educhum Eyimbuache, emphasized the need to adopt a holistic education approach that is centered around technology. We must constantly pause and ask ourselves whether we are indeed prepared for both the environment, the world system, the environment and its world system, 
and the caliber of minds that we are charged to shape for the next generation. Currently, our universities are largely populated by Generation Zs. But in the next five years, the latest generation, Generation Alpha, will enter our institutions of higher learning. Born between 2010 and 2024 or 2025, they are the first generation to have grown up in a world that fully encapsulates technology. The conference centered on the inclusive and equitable quality lifelong learning opportunities. Abdullah Osman's report read to you. Away from that, women poultry and livestock farmers in the Upper East region have appealed to the government to provide them with incentives to boost their trade. The call was made at the launch of the Women Poultry and Livestock Farmers Association in Bogatanga, where members identified the high cost of feed and building proper shelter for their animals as major challenges. Correspondent Albert Sorry reports. The Women Poultry and Livestock Farmers Association was formed to mobilize women young girls and physically challenged persons in the communities to engage in poultry and livestock production as a business to ensure food and nutrition security and create employment. At the launch of the association at Bolgatanga here in the Upper East region, its president, Teresa Alegmia, said the cost of poultry and livestock feed was a significant burden, making it difficult for the women farmers to maintain their businesses. She also highlighted the need for proper shelter for their animals. The feed of our poultry is very expensive. To go and even feed the few fowls that you have is not easy. Apart from the feed, sometimes they, they will hatch. You know, they, they need to be confined. And not all of us have built a place for their animals and fowls. So even this season, which is rainy season, if you leave them open, they easily die. My, myself, I even made a, this in the guinea fowls. One heavy rain came and cleared all those small one well, because they came out a visit by joy news to the farm of one of the members of the women poultry and livestock farmers association revealed impressive effort and progress but the owner edna atibila said the challenges she has faced have made it difficult to achieve the kind of success she desires when it comes to the success there's nothing yet because I remember my first best, because I was new in it, I requested for layers. When they are small, you can't be able to tell whether they are cocks or hens. So when I ordered and they brought them about 100 best, they were all cocks. So I had to sell them because they were not laying, they were not giving me eggs. I took them to the market and they were buying it at low as 50 Ghana cities. You know, they, they feed a low that I, I spent the money on. I didn't even break an even. It, 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 it wasn't good at all. The women poultry and livestock farmers are calling on the government for support. We will want the government to support women, especially they will give us in subsidized uh, way. In giving us even the fowls, the smaller ones, if they can support us, because some of them do not have. They, to afford to buy the, the, the chicks self, it is not easy. Upper East Regional Director of the Ministry of Food and Agriculture, Alhaji Zakaria Fuseni, assured the women poultry and livestock farmers of his support. Sadem is into animal production, which includes poultry. So I'm in constant touch with the coordinator, the national coordinator for Wopola to benefit. If you look at our Annual work plan and budget. We have made provision for such groups. For now, the Women Poultry and Livestock Farmers Association will have to rely on each other and their personal hard work to succeed as they hope to expand their membership nationwide. For Joy News, Albert Sorry, Bolgatanga. The push to promote Africa as a top tourist destination 
is gaining momentum as experts and industry players convene in Botswana for the 2024 7th Africa Tourism Leadership Forum. The event has attracted renowned global experts, ministers, CEOs, and other key stakeholders in the tourism sector, all focused on strategies to help African countries, including Ghana, fully capitalize on the ongoing tourism boom. Maxwell Agbagba has more in this report. Hundreds of people from the tourism um, industry all across Africa have gathered here in the capital of Botswana, Gaborone, um, to take part in the African Leadership Tourism um, Forum, all with one common aim and objective, to promote the Destination Africa agenda. The Africa Tourism Leadership Forum, ALTF, is the only Pan-African dialogue platform that brings together key public and private sector leaders and other stakeholders from across Africa and the rest of the world's travel, tourism, hospitality and aviation sectors to share insights, devise strategies for intra-Africa and tourism growth and network while enhancing the brand equity of Destination Africa. Speaking at a press briefing, Chief Executive Officer of Africa Tourism Partners, the organizers of the event, Kwachi Donko, urged various African tourism boards to decentralize the operations within Africa. What are we doing? So the tourism boards, unfortunately, they are not in the room, also need to change the mindset around it. And a lot of them, you see, they have offices in Germany, they have offices in Europe, and you we'll, we have offices in Ghana. What are we doing in Ghana? They don't have an office in Ghana. But they are able to pay lawyers and pounds. And if you see the arrivals that come there and work in the economy, sometimes it doesn't make sense. So there is a lot more than what meets the eye. And I think there is a lot of it. And that is why we do what we do. And that's why we have ATLF to have opportunity to talk about these things. Mm -hmm. I hope that responds to the questions. Mm -hmm. okay. On the first day, there were master class sessions, business to business sessions, and many other activities carefully designed to enhance participants' knowledge and equip them with the tools to transform their countries into tourism hubs in Africa. Director of Trade in Services, Investment, IPR, and Digital Trade at the African Continental Free Trade Area, Emily Imburu Indoria, stated that the African Union is working to implement the Yamusukro decision which will improve air transport links, enabling faster and more efficient movement of goods and people across the continent, thereby supporting trade and tourism. And in this case, the air transport. And here, the AU, the African Union, actually does have a program of, uh, to have the single African air transport market. And under that program, there is actually a secretariat that is working towards ensuring that we implement what we call the Yamasukro Agreement, where countries have agreed to liberalize even their traffic rights in such a way that you can actually be able to have more transport or more connectivities and picking within countries. And an example can be the way uh, to uh, the Kenya Airways, to West Africa. Uh, there is a flight that goes through uh, uh, Ghana, so they can pick uh, 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 passengers in Accra and then take the uh, passengers to Monrovia or to Dakar in Senegal and then pick other passengers there, drop them in, um, uh, in Accra on the way back to Nairobi. So those are just the different agreements that are covered in terms of ensuring that we allow for more traffic um, movement in the, in the continent. In December, People from the diaspora and other parts of the world flock to Ghana to experience the festivities, celebrations and cultural events that bring the country to life. The Beyond the Return Initiative, particularly Dirty December, has prominently placed Ghana on the African destination map. As Ghana prepares for the December election, some may wonder how the celebrations will unfold. Deputy Tourism Minister Marco Krikumante is urging political parties to avoid statements that could heighten the country's political tensions and potentially discourage visitors. He made these remarks on the sidelines of the event. Yes, um, in the next few months we are going for elections, which will somehow uh, fuse itself with what people will come in for in December. Uh, it is up to us as a country not to create tension, not to say things that put people off, not to create an environment that comes across as toxic so that it does not affect people who want to visit. 
And so it is up to us as a people how we decide to go around it. We, 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 we are known for peaceful elections over the years. I, I'm, I'm not thinking that this will be exceptional. We are going to do what we know how to do best in December. We are peaceful people. We hand over beautifully. We believe in democracy and we're going to do it again. And so if we, we the leaders, uh, Vice President Dr. Mahmoud Baumia, uh, John, the ex-president John Ramani Mahama, they decide and the other people who are also coming on board. Uh, I'm mentioning these two because we know the competition is between the two. Mm -hmm. And so if they decide to, to, to call for peace, they decide to go decorous, the crumb with the whole thing that we are going to do. I'm sure that the one who is coming to party in December, it doesn't really care who the president is. His interest or helpful interest will be a peaceful Ghana that you can have your fun in December as usual. On that note, let's go for our business update. In our first business story, senior finance lecturer at the Department of Economics at the University of Ghana, Dr. Priscilla Chubisi Bafo, is cautioning against the over-dependence on imports to stabilize the exchange rate. According to her, there must be the deliberate effort to invest more into production to limit the importation of some goods into the country. Her comments follows a report which shows that business confidence in the banking sector dipped due to the rapid exchange rate depreciation. The sustenance of the exchange rate, um, I will say that it means we need to limit the extent to which we are dependent on imports. And so, for example, um, are there conversations, are there attempts for us to, for instance, produce a lot of the things that are not um, very important yet imported into the country? We know that, yes, some classes of imports there's nothing we can do because we do not have the expertise, such as, uh, I mean, medicines, other highly um, technology-driven um, goods and services that we are not at the forefront to be able to produce locally. Um, but when it comes to um, basic things like food, drinks, and other things, um, I believe that light manufacturing, I believe that as a country we should get um, back to basics and produce some of these things to ease the persistence, um, um, what do we call it, uh, pressure on the city. And even when it comes to um, the local production, you ask yourself, the firms that are losing confidence in the current in the environment because of the currency, um, how integrated are they locally? A lot of them, they do not even get their raw materials in the um, uh, in the country. So it means that they are also supplying the currency um, for um, the dollar, and that also puts pressure. So indeed, I think that um, we are really getting um, to a point where we need to get back to basics and, and tackle um, the core issues to solve the problem. Now, the Bank of Ghana has revealed that it will stay on the path of tight monetary policy to help sustain the city recovery. The central bank also expects government to be focused on fiscal consolidation going into the election period. There's more in this report. The revelation could mean that the Bank of Ghana will still go ahead with measures that will help maintain tight liquidity on the market. This could result in some policy rate hikes in the coming months to help control the amount of money in circulation. The Bank of Ghana believes that this move may go a long way to ensure we don't have too much CDs in circulation that could fuel dollar purchases as some individuals may take steps to hedge against inflation. The central bank also believes that this approach of the tight monetary policy will help in bringing down inflation rate on the market, which has been on the downward path in recent times. The Bank of Ghana is also looking forward to government pressing ahead with policy measures to control its expenditure and raise the required revenue that will also help in dealing with confidence issues about the economy. The Bank of Ghana is also signaling that it is committed to improve dollar support for the market through its auction programs. It believes these measures should help sustain the recent gains made by the Ghana CD.
And this brings us to the end of the AM News Bulletin on the AM Show. Coming up next is the news review segment. Dr. Ezekiel Obeng from the NPP Communications team. Lawyer Osman Ayariga, Deputy National Youth Organizer of the NDC, are joining us to review the various stories captured in the newspapers. We are back on your screens in a bit.